Hey everyone, this is Will from Going Awesome Places, and guess what? I'm in Hong Kong. I'm spending a week here to show you all the best things you should consider adding to your itinerary. That's food, adventure, sights and sounds, fun times. Let's do this. Before we get into the details, here's everything that led me to Hong Kong. This was part of my three months in Asia where I started in the far east of Hokkaido, explored more in and around Sapporo, ate at some of the best food spots in Tokyo, uncovered the hidden island of Shikoku, and then later meeting up with my parents in Asia where I guided them through the golden route of Japan. Make sure to check out those videos in the description down below. Hong Kong was the last big part of the trip. In seven days in Hong Kong, half of it was with my parents and the other half on my own. Having been to Hong Kong several times before, I wanted to plan an itinerary that featured the authentic side of the city, highlighted by its outdoors, the islands, street food, and both classic sites and new developments as well. Next up, Hong Kong. If you're already in Asia, getting to Hong Kong is really easy. In our case, we we're flying from Tokyo to Hong Kong with Hong Kong Express. This was my first time flying with them, and I'll say that while it costs less than 250 Canadian to get there, they operate very much like a low-cost carrier, so make sure your carry-on and check-in are within weight restrictions. They check everything. Leaving the crisp autumn air of Japan, it was a welcome change with the immediate blast of humidity and warmth. Once you leave your baggage area, check the Hong Kong Tourism Board office. At the time, there was a Hong Kong Night Treats promotion, so there might be something going on when you arrive. If not, get your Airport Express tickets. Now tip, if you're traveling in a group, they have a discounted group ticket that is cheaper than paying for them individually. While you're at it, grab an octopus cart and load it up with money because you'll need it for the whole week to get around. It makes life so much easier. And just like that, you're at Central Station in 24 minutes. Now that we have that out of the way, let's jump into our guide for a week in Hong Kong. Let's start with the best places you should go. It definitely feels good to be back in Hong Kong. So much action out here. All right, so we're now headed towards a ladies' market, a uh, place that you gotta go when you come to Hong Kong. This is it. This is ladies' market. Ladies' Market is a one-kilometer stretch covering four blocks and consists of stalls selling all sorts of extremely touristy things and knockoff product. While some don't think it's worth coming here, I feel like it's the kind of place that you come for the atmosphere, not necessarily for the shopping. I get a kick and oftentimes a laugh at what you see for sale here. You might not buy anything here at Ladies' Market, but it's always fun to look around. One of Hong Kong's newest areas is West Kowloon, and this is a green space dedicated to art, culture, and has some incredible views. This is a wedge-shaped waterfront built from reclaimed land. The first phase opened in 2015, and the second phase is expected to be done in 2026. When you get here, start by exploring the art park, a large green space that is great for playing, relaxing, running, biking, picnicking, and taking in the beautiful views of the harbor from the waterfront promenade, which also has a second deck to enjoy views from. As an open space, it's a perfect venue for performances, exhibitions, and cultural events. The idea of West Kowloon Cultural District was to create an arts and cultural hub that centered around green spaces and also performing in exhibition centers and museums. You won't have time to visit them all, but we recommend two of the main ones. And this is the Hong Kong Palace Museum. This museum focuses on ancient Chinese art and culture, but presents it in a contemporary architectural lens. I was particularly blown away by their main exhibit, which brings to light artifacts and stories from the Forbidden Palace in Beijing, and more specifically, during the Qing Dynasty. Through the viewing of immersive elements and many never-before-displayed treasures, you get to experience what life was like in the court. You'll also appreciate the three atriums stacked on different levels of the museum each offering panoramic vistas of the city and surroundings in different directions. And this is M+. The second museum you need to visit. This is Asia's first global museum of contemporary visual art and is packed with collections that span the 20th and 21st century visual art, design, and architecture. Once you come up to the main floor of the museum, there's a beautiful spiral staircase in the middle 
and on the outer edges are the entrances to its labyrinth of galleries featuring many works that you may have seen before and others that you'll be intrigued to learn more about. What I really appreciate about this museum is that it's a museum of modern art that also has a strong focus in Asian and Chinese artists and themes. Head up to the third floor to walk the north and south roof gardens. There are a few sculptures out here and there's quite the remarkable view of the West Kowloon Cultural District and nearby marine works. As you make your way down to the basement, you'll see the sprawling work of Yoyo Kusama's Death of Nerves, where stuffed and dotted fabric hang between three floors like roots of a tree or nervous system. And when you're done, head back out to the promenade and enjoy a beautiful sunset. Coming out of Sung Wong Toy MTR Station, head into Carpenter Road Park, and adjacent to that is the Kowloon Walled City Park. So this is what's left of the Kowloon Walled City. It's been transformed into this beautiful outdoor urban park and so completely demolished in 1992. So what's left is this 3D model right in front of me. There's the Yaman building over there, which is 80% original. And behind me are the remains of the South Gate. Actually, I'm not sure what I expected when coming here. Part of me was hoping to see more remnants, but there really isn't that much left. Start your visit with the model. It's a very accurate representation of the space where the park is now and gives you a sense of just how densely populated it was. The cross-section mural on the wall here also illustrates just how tightly packed it was. If you're lucky, there might also be one of the volunteers here so you can ask questions. Adjacent to the model are the remnants of the South Gate. An archaeological excavation during the creation of the park revealed the main entrance to the original walled city when it was a garrison town built in 1847. Here, you'll see the original path, drainage ditch, and two stone plaques that say South Gate and Kowloon Walled City. The other point of interest is the Yamin building. It's the only building that survived the demolition and consists of three halls and was used for a number of different purposes, including a senior home, place for refugees, school, and clinic. Today, it's a museum and they built several immersive spaces to give you a better sense of what life was like in the Walled City. So just left the MTR station and we're doing a hike out to a place called Kowloon Peak Viewing Point. And I picked this spot because I was really looking for a place that had an awesome sunset view of the city down below and it wasn't too crazy of a hike. Now this hike is part of a larger one that goes all the way to Suicide Cliff and everything, but I'm afraid of heights. I ain't doing that. So following some instructions that, are, that I found online to go up to the viewing point and come back down. Hopefully it's not too bad. Wish me luck. <laughs> Getting kind of hot. It's all uphill from here. The target is up there, but you'll be taking the non-suicide cliff up. We're at the first junction point, and this is where we cross over and head up some more. Following the road at this point, a couple people here and there so I know I'm on the right track. They're getting higher, that's for sure. You keep going up until you see this side path with a sign in front that says danger. As you'll see though, it's not particularly dangerous but it does give your legs a big workout. So we're on the path up and I spoke to another hiker. He said it's only 30 minutes to the top. So with any luck, I'll be there pretty soon. But so far, not too bad. Definitely some Stairmaster involved, some loose rock, but really not too bad at all. Whew. Okay, I think we're in the final stretch. That's a sweet view behind me. We're almost there. Made it to the top, I think. Okay, I lied. Now this is the Kowloon Peak. Okay, so the sun has gone down. We're doing the final kind of section I wanted to check out. This is past the peak, obviously. Um, there's kind of a lookout point which we're gonna make it out to, and uh, that's pretty much right before Suicide Cliff. 
This part sure kicked up my vertigo as you really start seeing how high up you are. There was a point even when I had to get down on all fours just so I could focus on the ground. I got as far as this point, enjoying the night view and taking a ton of epic photos. So now I am starting to hike down in the dark. Luckily I have my headlamp and uh, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> It's finally time to cross over to the Hong Kong island side. While it may seem that this side is all about skyscrapers and big banks, there are many highlights to see and is filled with character. A picturesque temple to visit is Munmo Temple in Xiongwan. It's a tribute to the god of literature and god of war, so this is the place you'd come if you want to ace an upcoming exam or solve conflicts. The most striking feature when you walk inside are the wafts of smoke coming from the spirals of incense suspended from the roof. Next to it is also a separate place of worship for other Buddhist and Taoist deities. Something I love about walking around the Hong Kong island is that it's quieter, less chaotic, easier to go at a slower pace, has plenty of boutique shops, and lots of great murals as well. Located in central Soho district is Dai Gun, what was once a closed compound consisting of a police station, central magistracy, and prison, it's now been converted to a cultural hub and simply a really cool place to hang out. With 16 revitalized heritage buildings, you'll learn about the police that operated here, established by the British in 1841. Delve deeper and you'll see Victoria Prison, which was only fully decommissioned in 2006. You'll get to walk inside a preserved prison hall and another that has art installations and a cafe. There are also two museums here called the JC Contemporary and JC Cube. Both are spaces for exhibitions and performing arts. This perfectly lines up with your next destination, the famed Victoria Peak. A quintessential Hong Kong experience is to take the Peak Tram, which was modernized in 2022. Pro tip, if you have an octopus card, don't bother lining up. Simply tap at the turnstile and you're in. Wow, they completely redid this. I was impressed. Everything is brand new, including the trams themselves, which now have nearly double the capacity, has wider doors, is completely step free, and has larger panoramic windows. And welcome to the peak. You disembark on a temperature controlled platform and enter through a souvenir shop. Inside the peak tower, there's also Madame Tussauds, restaurants, and cafes. In fact, the best spot we found was this outdoor patio belonging to Pacific Coffee, where you can sit and enjoy the views and also the tram itself coming up and down. Of course, if you continue walking along the path, there's a well-known pagoda and observation point that has the best unobstructed view from the peak. Spend time looking at how expansive the full skyline is of both the Hong Kong side and Kowloon side, but also focus in on the details. There's also the other shopping mall, the Peak Galleria, which has a free rooftop that also has views of the southwest side of Hong Kong Island. If you're looking for retail therapy and good food, Causeway Bay is always a must visit. And when you're ready to leave, hop on a Hong Kong tram, affectionately called a Ding Ding. These are double-decker trams that run the length of Hong Kong Island and is a super affordable way to see the city. If you can, the best seats are on the second deck right up at the front. With the windows down, it's a brilliant ride that only costs three Hong Kong dollars. For the photographers out there, I have two spots that you should consider adding to your itinerary. Now, if you're looking to photograph something like this, the building you're looking for is called the Monster Building, and it's between Quarry Bay and Taiku stations on the Hong Kong Island side. Monster Building is actually an E-shaped complex of five buildings. Enter into the complex and look up. It's quite the popular spot, so expect to find a ton of people taking photos, but we notice that most people clear out after dark. Keep in mind that this is a residential building, so make sure to be respectful and quiet. The second one starts at Hong Kong MTR station. Pop up, cross onto the pedestrian walkway, cut through IFC Mall quickly, and again onto the walkway. When you see the sign for 2 China Chem Plaza, get on the bridge, turn around, and see a perfect framing with the IFC, Bank of China Tower, and the zipping of cars and buses below. This is a perfect spot for long exposure photography that isn't well marked, but you'll find on our blog's Hong Kong itinerary. And how can I forget another legendary experience riding the green and white double-decker Star Ferry? For sightseeing, the second deck is where you want to be. To the Star Ferry we go! It's only slightly more expensive, but it's air-conditioned, has comfortable seats, 
and has better elevated views. Not only is this a tourist attraction, it's also the cheapest way to get across Victoria Harbour, whether you're going from Hong Kong Island to Kowloon or the other way around. For one of your days in Hong Kong, I highly recommend that you go to one of its many outlying islands. Having been to two other islands in the past, I wanted to go somewhere different with my parents. Now, Hong Kong is known to be a giant metropolis, but there are some beautiful outdoor green spaces. And one of the best ways to do that is to take a ferry like this one out to an outlying island like Pengzhou Island. It's actually pronounced Pengzhou Island. Getting there is easy from the central pier number six on the Hong Kong side. The beauty of these ferries is that they all take octopus card, so as long as you have it loaded up, tap, and you're in. This is a two-level ferry that goes pretty fast. If the weather is good, head out to the open deck at the back of the second level. We are on a boat. Enjoy the ride and the views as well. Oh, that was a quick 30-minute ferry. Once you step off the ferry, you're in the main part of the island where you get a taste of real village life. It's an island that's stuck to a bygone era. As you explore, the charm of the island comes through with squid and shiitake mushrooms hanging out to dry, see several temples such as Tinhao Temple, Golden Flower Shrine, Seven Sister Temple, and Lungmo Temple, watch fishermen organize their nets, pass by a massive banyan tree, and eat delicious food from restaurants like Ho Ho Kitchen with their rice dishes and famous pineapple bun ice cream sandwich. Wow, this is incredible. Where the island thrives is in its secluded natural wonders. It is a gorgeous day out here. It starts with the trail that runs through the entire crescent shape of the island. You go out to Dai Lei Island, which is connected by bridge that's quite photogenic and features a rock formation that juts out into the water and something called Turtle Rock. Chinese love to name their rocks, so of course, there are other ones you'll encounter like Snoopy Rock and Fisherman's Rock near the water. There's also this island that to me looks more like a turtle. Along the way, there are also several pavilions that allow you to take breaks. The hike ultimately rises 355 steps up to Finger Hill. You'll be huffing and puffing when you get to the top, but it rewards you with awesome views with its two pavilions. It's here that you also realize how close you are to the city and the far eastern side of Lantau Island, which is of course where Hong Kong Disney is. For the beach lovers, there's something for you too, as there are plenty of secluded beaches around the island. In the center, there's also a large beach called Dongwan Beach. You'll encounter them all as you do your hike around Pingzhou. Having an island day is always one of my favorite parts of visiting Hong Kong. When you get back, right next to the pier is Hong Kong Observation Wheel and Vitality Park, so make sure to check it out. And this is also the same area where you can catch the iconic Red Sail Junk Boat. We made it to Pier 9 where we're doing the Aqua Luna Evening Harbor Cruise. This Victoria Harbor Cruise picks up people from both sides of the harbor before setting off. The best time to do this is right at sunset. We're about to board the Aqua Luna. All aboard! Aqua Luna is one of the operators that offers a 45 minute cruise and gives you the best views of Hong Kong as the sun dips and the city comes alive with its sparkling night lights. The cruise includes a complimentary drink, so cheers to that. And yup, my parents loved it. While I really enjoy the Star Ferry, Aqua Luna gives you ample time to relax and properly enjoy the sights and sounds. If you're interested in this cruise, make sure to click on the link, scan the QR code, or go to the description down below. After disembarking in Tsimza Zui, check out the former Kowloon Canton Railroad Clock Tower and walk the newly revitalized Avenue of the Stars. And if you go further down, you'll also see handprint plaques of famous Chinese stars. Okay, I got one more for you that won't even look like you're in Hong Kong at all. From Diamond Hill MTR Station back on the Kowloon side, go to the bus stand and wait for bus 96R. We discuss all the transportation options in our article but the key is to come here on the weekend because that's the only time 96R runs, saving you the hassle of needing to take a taxi. This bus makes a stop at the fishing town of Saigong, but keep going. You'll get off at the Buk Tam Chung stop and wait for the mini green bus 9A. This takes you the final 9 km stretch to the High Island Reservoir East Dam. What makes this area unique is that it belongs to a large protected area known as the Hong Kong Global Geopark. And this is the Hong Kong Geopark and the High Island Reservoir East Dam. This area is particularly rich in super rare rhyolitic volcanic rock columns that was revealed during the excavation work for the dam. 
Thanks to this work, it's the only one where you can walk to on foot and get right up to the hexagonal rock columns. And that's the beauty of Hong Kong, isn't it? You can be in the city in one moment, and in another, you're in a beautiful outdoor space like this. Spend your day hiking the High Island Geo Trail, which consists of the Reservoir Monument, the Overlook of the Reservoir, Geo Park Monument, hexagonal rock columns, including the buckled S-shaped hexagonal columns. Well, I certainly didn't expect to see this in Hong Kong. The Inner Coffer Dam, Sea Cave, the lower wall, which consists of thousands of concrete wave dissipating dolos, and Sea Stack Island that you can hike close to. If you have time, we highly recommend you incorporate this into your Hong Kong itinerary. A heads up, if you're here on the weekend, don't wait until sunset to head back. The lineup for the 9A bus back gets ridiculously long, so plan to head back earlier to avoid the long wait. As you can tell, there are a ton of things to do in Hong Kong. In our next video, we cover some awesome places to eat and where to stay. You won't want to miss it, so head there next. And remember, head over to our full itinerary on our blog using this QR code or head down to the description below. See you in the next one. Now a little behind the scenes, I set up my tripod for this and for a good 30 minutes, I had to go back and forth from the camera to this rock for photos and then this video. Each time my vertigo was on full blast, even though it wasn't really a full drop ahead of me. Every time I knew the shots were done, I couldn't get off that rock fast enough.